So the first one was um, an interesting study by Sarah Newcomb. Uh, did anybody happen to go to the Jumpstart Coalition, um, uh, the National Conference for Teachers? I hear she was really great last year as their keynote speaker. She was also the keynote speaker for the American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences in June. So I heard her speak. and. Um, my big two takeaways from her is that if you want to change people's financial behaviors, two things happen to happen. First of all, people have to have some future-mindedness. They have to be kind of long-range planners and, and be thinking ahead as to what they want to have happen in their future. However, having just said that, I want to share something that a teacher in North Jersey said yesterday. It really resonated with me. She said that when she talks to her students, she does not use the word future because it's not a topic that many children, you know, teens, particularly those coming from economically challenged families, they don't relate to the word future because everything is today. So what she does instead, and she finds it really helpful, is she uses now and later and uses that instead. So I just passed that along as one teacher's success story. But Sarah Newcomb found that when people focus in on the future or the later, if you will, they tend to be less impulsive and regardless of their le level of financial literacy. And so what she found is when people were impulsive, when they were, were materialistic, they didn't make very good financial decisions, unfortunately. And the strongest predictor they found in their research of making good financial decisions was focus on the future. So one of the activities that you're going to do in about 25 minutes is to brainstorm among people in your group is what can we do as financial educators to get our students to be more future-minded. If, if the research is saying that is the key to financial success, how do we actually do that with students? Okay, this is a research study that I happen to be the lead author on, so sh shameless self-promotion here, but it was recently published in the Journal of Family and Consumer Sciences. And what we did is we used data from our personal health and finance quiz that we have on the Rutgers Cooperative Extension website, and we found a relationship between the practice of budgeting and 18 different behaviors, nine that had to do with finances and nine that had to do with health. And we kind of theorized that maybe it was because a lot of the health behaviors that are in our quiz are actually budgeting, but you're budgeting calories instead of money. So there may be something to just having a mindset of being able to self-regulate yourself and to stay within whatever boundaries you create for yourself, whether they happen to be calorie boundaries or uh, you know, money boundaries. So anyway, we use the variable, I follow a handwritten or computer generated spending plan to guide my spending and savings. So we were looking for people who were really formal budgeters, not people who just said, oh, I do it in my head. They had to really have some kind of formal document. Okay, you might be teaching about credit. How many of you do credit in your classroom? Probably all of you. Okay, just some updated statistics in case your students ask. Um, the average American household debt is $5,700. However, that includes people who either carry a balance or don't. So how many of you are convenience users? You pay your bill in full and you just use credit cards either for interest or points or both. Raise your hand. Okay, so a lot of you are. Not surprising, we're financial educators. But if you take everyone in the pool, so the people who are convenience users and the people who revolve balances, then the average uh, for those balance carrying households alone, if you just segment them out, then it's $16,048. It's a much higher average because these are the people with carrying balances. And they estimated from the Federal Reserve that almost four in 10 people with um, households with credit are carrying a balance forward. So they are paying interest. A little bit more on credit card debt. Last year, in the past year, we breached the $1 trillion mark as far as outstanding credit card debt. So it's the highest mark it's been since the Great Recession. So if you remember back in 2008, people kind of got scared off, got religion a little bit about their finances, and now, of course, the pendulum has kind of swung back again, and people are charging. 
Some of the reasons in the article, and by the way, the slides that I sent you, obviously you can access all the source material that I use for these slides. Some of the reasons that were given were um, incomes have been rising for some people, not everybody, and probably not as much as people would like, but it has gotten better since 2008. Um, um, unemployment figures have gotten better as well. And also we have a lot of people, particularly young people, millennial age generation, who um, are not necessarily buying homes, but they are using credit for other things. You know, they're not, it might, it, it's not going toward a mortgage payment, but it may be going to other things that they're using credit for. So now credit cards as well as student loan debt, which is now about $1.4 trillion, and auto loans are the three types of loans that are now over a um, trillion dollars outstanding. But the good news from the article is that so far there isn't a lot of indication that people are having trouble paying off their credit card debt. So while the balances have been rising, people have been able to handle their payments. This is one that really stuck home to me, particularly if you talk in, how many of you do reality simulations and you have kids that have, kids have kids. You know, you give your kids cases, scenarios, and they have three kids or something like that. Well, this is about childcare. This is a study that came out from the New America Foundation. They found that full-time care in a center for a child under the age of four, four or under, costs more than the average in-state college tuition. Huh? I mean, who would have thought? But again, infant care, young and child care is very expensive. You can see the numbers there on the slide. So not surprisingly, they said that um, one-fifth of people who have childcare are trying to patchwork it together because it's just too expensive. People can't afford to pay for center care, so they're doing things creatively, like maybe the parents are working different shifts or you know, trying to patch something together, relatives caring for kids, just to make it uh, ends meet. Anybody to, uh, teach about retirement in your classes? Okay. May, you know, I, I teach it to my students at Rutgers more from a proactive standpoint because obviously things could be very different in 45 years. But um, the, the message I want to get across, and I assume you do too, is that you start early. You start putting money aside early. So this is some data from the latest um, retirement confidence survey. And they found that 69% of um, people, workers, or their spouse had saved something for retirement. So, you know, flip side is, you know, about 31% hadn't. So almost a third basically have not saved anything for retirement. They also find every year with this study that there's a big gap between um, Workers and retirees. Workers say they're going to work till a much older age, and then when they interview the retirees, the retirees retired a lot earlier than they expected. And a lot of it has to do with um, either health issues, downsizing issues, or family, um, family care issues, you know, caring for an older parent, that kind of thing, caregiving. So um, big gap. So that speaks to the importance of not being you know, kind of unrealistic in thinking how long you'd be able to work because sometimes things happen in life and you're not, not going to be able to do that and then maybe you haven't saved enough. 41% of workers had calculated what they needed to save for retirement. So flip side of that, obviously, is 59% hadn't. And then this is the one that's really scary to me. I mean, this really makes me sit up and, and, and pa take pause here. Is what's going to happen to people in, in a few years? And that's um, this whole thing about um, retirement. Uh, savings. They found in the Retirement Confidence Survey, 47% of workers had $25,000, less than $25,000 saved. And that excluded the value of the home because it's, the assumption is you're going to live in your home. You can't, you know, get investment income out of it if you're living in it. And then also it excluded pensions, which a lot of people don't have anyway. And then of that 47%, 24% had less than $1,000 saved. I mean, think about that. That's one quarter of Americans have less than $1,000 saved for retirement. That's not going to get you more than maybe a month through your retirement, and people could live 35 years. So pretty, pretty scary. 
Okay, uh, millennial retirement planning. This is a study that came out from the AICPA, the Certified Public Accountants, and they were looking at millennials and they found that there's two big things that are obstacles for that generation, which is now roughly, you know, age 20 to 35. So actually, a lot of you are teaching the next generation. You're teaching Gen Z. And there's some really good videos out there. We showed a few at the uh, teacher exchange back in April that have to do with um, Gen Z and some of their characteristics. But the millennials who are a little bit older. Um, what it came down to is that a lot of them were really scared off by the Great Recession. They saw their parents lose a lot of value in their retirement accounts at a very impressionable age. And many of them are very afraid of losing money. So the key point that we have to emphasize to young adults is that time is on their side, they have a lot of a time to invest, and they also have time diversification, which means that um, all the ups and downs, you know, the peaks and valleys that you see in the stock market on a day-to-day -day basis get, you know, smoothed out when you go over a period of time. Anybody talk about reverse mortgages in your classes? Probably not so much. It's mostly for older people. So this you might find useful personally more than uh, in the classroom, other than maybe mentioning it in passing, is that um, a bunch of research has come out in the last year. And what they have found is that reverse mortgages can actually have some very good financial planning aspects to them. You know, the old school thinking, which you have to kind of erase now, uh, was that um, reverse mortgages were a last resort. But it's turning out now, they've been doing some computer simulations, that they can actually be used to stretch out a person's retirement income. So if a person takes a reverse mortgage in their 60s and delays Social Security until age 70 and gets all those delayed retirement credits, they actually will come out ahead with some of the assumptions that have been used. So just be aware that there is another side now to that. Um, if any of your students ask you about household incomes, uh, it was reported recently that the median income had increased. It was the first gain in household income since 2007. So again, we're seeing positive numbers kind of reflecting the, company, uh, the country digging out of the Great Recession. Uh, you can see the numbers up there. And of course, the reason we do median, which is half below, half above, is because averages tend to skew, you know, when you have all the rich people kind of skewing up the numbers there. So um, that's the median um, income for the households. And also there was a slight decrease in the poverty rate, so things are good. However, um, the important thing to kind of get across to people and to really understand is um, the tale of two Americas, that we have these encouraging numbers on the national recovery and that sort of thing. But many people are still struggling. And you see that in some of the income numbers and asset numbers at the uh, lower end of the spectrum. And particularly where we're seeing this a lot is in middle income jobs. Many of those are kind of being hollowed out. And there's growth on the high end. And there's growth on the lower end. And then in the middle, um, that's where many people are hurting. Some of you may have seen this study. And again, this is a good type of statistic. Um, Tim does a lot of what they call data crunches, where you take a piece of data and you use it as a point of discussion in your classroom. So try this for your students, telling them that according to the Federal Reserve, 46% of adults in this country said that they could not cover an emergency expense um, of $400. $400 without selling something or hitting somebody up with money or borrowing it in some way. That's a lot of financial fragility here. We have a lot of people who are really living on the edge. And again, this same study from the Federal Reserve kind of goes along with the one I told you about the EBRI study is they found 31% of non-retired people had no retirement savings. Just to make it a little bit more positive, we're kind of going back and forth, there has been an increase in what they define as upper middle class incomes. These are national figures, and they defined in this particular study a household income between $100,000 and $350,000. And you can see there on the slide that almost 30% of the population now fits in that group. 
So we have a lot of people struggling on this end. We have some people doing pretty well on that end. Um, it's not been a very even recovery. And then this is my last slide. This is a new index that just came out for personal finance called the GFLAC Personal Finance Index. And that comes from the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center at George Washington University uh, in DC. And I tried to get a hold of their questions for you guys because I thought it would be really good for you to use in your classroom and for me to use in my class at Rutgers. And it's top secret. They, they could not share their questions, unfortunately. So the only thing that they could tell me, because they don't want them out there because they're going to be redoing this every year and they don't want the answers being out there somewhere. So um, there are 28 questions in what they define as eight functional areas, you know, different topic areas of personal finance. And on average, U.S. adults answered 49% of the questions correctly. And only 16% could answer over 75% correctly. So fair to say there's um, a lot of gaps in people's financial knowledge that we need to address. And comprehending risk had the lowest level of knowledge that, you know, is kind of in, ties in with insurance and maybe even some investment risk. I'm not sure how they define risk because I haven't seen the, the questions, uh, but obviously that was an area where people uh, needed to do some work.